You are live with The App Show. Mike Agarbo here with my app nerd friends, Graham Williams and John Beeler. We've got uh, a great program for you today here on The App uh, Show. Later on, uh, we will be chatting with a a 14-year-old student that uh, has actually developed his own apps. He's uh, here in Vancouver, and uh, we'll be talking about uh, how he is uh, taking part in a uh, contest with Apple using their Swift uh, programming language uh, to win uh, prizes and uh, an opportunity to attend the Apple Worldwide Developers uh, Conference coming up uh, in June. Uh, this this kid is great, and you've got to stay tuned to, to listen to him uh, chat about how he's created some of these uh, apps. We will also be talking with the folks over Map and Hood. It's kind of like the ways for pedestrians. And so uh, they've launched in Toronto, and we'll be bringing this to other cities uh, across Canada as well. So uh, we'll uh, be getting low down on how they put that uh, all together. Let's look at some of the app news uh, this week, guys. Uh, lots happening there. I don't know if you uh, saw this. Uh, you can actually try to dock uh, your, your capsule with the International Space Station with um, a SpaceX Crew Dragon Simulator. Have you tried this, John? I haven't tried it, but uh, I really want to. It reminds me of that scene in Interstellar when... Uh, everyone's trying to capture or well, I don't want to spoil anything, but there's a certain person that they're trying to stop from docking and he switches to manual mode. And uh, it actually is quite difficult uh, in manual mode, as opposed to the automated ways that all the science fiction movies tend to show. So you can be like Matthew McConaughey from interstellar. Sure. Sure. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> I don't know if you ever saw, saw this story uh, as well. Tom Cruise is going to be blasted into space and will actually spend some time. <laughs> I, I, I thought this was a joke at first, but no, I think it's true. Uh, spend some time on the International Space Station. He'll, going, uh, he'll go up in a SpaceX uh, rocket and he will be filming a new movie. It's probably, I wonder if it's going to be a Mission Impossible. No, they said it's not. Oh, okay. No, but that's about nothing, all the details. Nothing about this surprises me. Not a nope. single thing. No. No, it's just like, you, you, you read a headline sometimes, you're like, Tom Cruise is going to be the first man to film a movie in space. And you're like, yeah, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, apparently he's not the first guy to film a movie in space. No. No. There was uh, another gentleman back a few years ago. But this uh, is like, this is a feature of film. Yes. Yes. Because yeah. we, we, had, we had Chris Hadfield who gave us, uh, you know, a fantastic rendition of Space Oddity um, from, uh, from space, right? Do you think... He he's doing this so he can get a free ride to space. I think he wants to go back home. <laughs> <laughs> Where all the Scientologists are? Is that? I won't comment further on that. I just think that Tom wants to phone home. Okay, that's uh, <laughs> an interesting take uh, on that. Uh, also, here in uh, the news, uh, Twitter and Google—they're allowing their employees to work from home till the end of the year. Yeah, well, I think Twitter said almost indefinitely, right? Yeah. Like this, is, this is a new corporate policy for them. And I'm, I'm having this conversation with so many of my peers and friends right now where everyone's saying, okay, this is great. We want the option to be able to go into the office if we need to sort of have a face-to-face meeting. But for the most part, we're more productive. We're more well-rested. We're happier. Um, I know for myself, like I've, I've, I've been on fire for the last two months. I, I don't really know that going back to the office for everybody with all of the carbon footprint that goes with it, does, does it seem like we should go back to quote unquote normal? I, I think Mike wants to justify the new office that he just built. <laughs> <laughs> he just bought a new space. This is, this is horrible. We actually bought uh, a new office space, spent uh, you know, stupid amounts of money because it's expensive to build it out, you know, build a new studio and uh, all the bells and whistles, and then the freaking pandemic hits. And so I'm paying a mortgage on this, you know, downtown Vancouver space. You know, it's it's killing me. It's beautiful, but it's killing me. And, and this is actually the thing that I, I think is so interesting is, you know, that space only had a, has so much space for expansion. And, and, you know, I think there was kind of growth ahead. So looking at that, it's like, okay, can we set up sort of a rotating cycle where we've got some folks in some days, some folks in other days? Uh, and can the organization get bigger perhaps than a space would allow uh, simply by not having everybody there all, all at the same time? Or we can get bunk beds. Bunk beds, yeah. Bunk I've desks. done that. Bunk desks. It's high ceilings. I could actually stack the desks on yep. top, top of each other. Brilliant. 
<laughs> but no, it's going to be interesting. So Twitter is saying that they're going to let their workers work from home indefinitely. Google said till the end of the year. What is this going to do to the future of the workplace? Are, are we going to see a giant pendulum swing here uh, in the other direction? And that not as many people will be coming into the into their office. They'll be able to work virtually from home. Uh, you know, and how long will that go before companies realize, hey, you know, it's actually better that we do have people in the office a little more often. Well, I, I think with the telecommuting that we're doing, even with things like Zoom and Microsoft Teams, um, you know, I, many many years ago, I worked for Best Buy uh, at their headquarters, and they had something called the Results Oriented Work Environment. They called it rowing, and uh, the whole point of it was. I remember speaking to one of the VPs at the time. He's like, I don't care when or where you do your work as long as it gets done by the time it's supposed to get done and isn't that really it like do you need to have this sort of supervision thing going on are we not adults there are all there are always going to be workplaces that will benefit from having people there and there are going to be times where you know we do some really creative stuff and it's great to actually have people around the table be able to hash things out right away um but i don't know that you know, all the gas costs or even the power costs, if you've got a Tesla, uh, really warrant all of us trekking in, trekking out for half an hour, 45 minutes every day, just to sit there for eight hours and then 45 minutes home when we could have actually just been spending that time being productive. Well, luckily you live right close to the studio, Graham, so we're going to make you come in five days a week. Because <laughs> <laughs> there'll be very little to no f- carbon footprint and we'll make you walk. I, I've noticed that you've also signed me up as uh, for janitorial duties. Th- thank you. That's kind. Well, you've got to know where you came from. Right, right Grant? <laughs> Every, everyone pitches in. Everyone right. pitches in. Uh, we're also following uh, more app news here. Another one that I thought was hilarious. I don't know if, if you guys are feeling the same right now, but this pandemic, I thought being locked into the house or self-isolating, uh, so to speak, I thought, you know what? I'm going to lose a ton of weight. You know, I used to eat out a lot. And, you know, we all know that if we cook more meals at home, uh, it'll be healthier and, you know, we'll be more fit. I know I'm gaining weight. I'm like cooking more than ever and I'm eating crap all the time. Your computer is in your kitchen. <laughs> I know. Whenever we do our Zoom calls, I'm like gone half the time because I'm like in the fridge or, or, or making something. <laughs> just just snacking away. The snack on, yeah. I'm, I'm, I got to be honest, I'm getting a little soft, a little... <laughs> <laughs> a little rounder around uh, the edges. So uh, a lot of these uh, fitness apps out there, and God bless them, uh, have been giving out uh, you know, their free versions or their, their paid versions for free uh, during this uh, pandemic. Uh, one of those uh, is Chris Hemsworth's workout app. Chris Hemsworth, you might know him from uh, the Marvel movies. Uh, he was Thor. Uh, he is uh, you know, obviously a big-time Hollywood actor. And he's got a, a yearly subscription-based workout app. I think it's 99 bucks a year. 99 US, yeah. US, okay. Anyway, uh, a lot of people are pissed off because they signed up for this free t- trial. And even though they, you know, a lot of them attempted to cancel it, they still got charged the 99 bucks. So <laughs> Thor, Thor is taking their money. <laughs> they, they tried to perform an extraction out of the app and... It's oh, I saw, I saw what you did there. Have you seen Extraction? <laughs> was, I have. Have you? Yeah, it was all right. It, it felt a little like Man on Fire. Did you ever see that one with uh, Denzel yeah, yeah. Washington? I think yeah. I, I think Man on Fire is the better version, but uh, Hemsworth kind of, he rocks it. Yeah. Fair. No. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'd download a, a Chris Hemsworth workout app, but... No, because you're going to get ding 99 bucks if you try to cancel <laughs> I remember when we were in uh, New York last summer for a Samsung event and the hotel we were staying at, Chris Hemsworth was actually staying there as well at the same time. And he was working out in their gym and a lot of people lost their minds in the hotel for obvious reasons to go and watch him work out. And now you can pay $99 to not watch him work out. Exactly. One more uh, news story here. Facebook is uh, paying $52 million in a settlement with moderators who developed PTSD on the job. So current and former moderators will all be paid a minimum of $1,000. To see all that horrible crap they had to watch <laughs> on Facebook. Well, this covers like, I, I didn't know they had so many op, uh, moderators. Uh, yeah. I think over 11,000 moderators. So what do you do for a living? I watch horrible stuff on the internet. 
I do that as a hobby personally. Um, <laughs> That's tough. Um, it, yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. Like I, I, I curate my, my social feeds, you know, um, and Facebook in particular, I've, I've got a, a fairly tight list. Um, but I still come across things that, you know, some friends share and you're like, this is the stupidest, most inaccurate thing. And the fact that you didn't know, and, 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 you, and, like, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Like when we take a look at some of the things that are going on around, you know, North America with these protests and things like that, you look at it and you're just like, what is wrong with some of you people? And then you realize that some of these folks have been exposed to things that are far, far worse. And Facebook is going to give them a thousand dollars. 52 million sounds like a lot of money until you realize that it's broken down across all of these people and the sheer horrors they had to see. I mean, Google has tried to do the automation thing, which I don't think has been terribly successful. No. Um, it, it's fascinating. Like you, you wander into the comments on any Facebook story on any sort of public news network and it's a cesspool. I don't, I don't know that I'd be able to do it. I just, yeah, I, I feel for these people. I, I think they're probably owed more. Yeah. That's, that's what I was thinking too. Yeah, it, um, from what I understand, uh, a lot of these, if not most of these uh, moderators were hired through third-party consulting uh, companies and, and not paid a lot. Uh, I think the average uh, pay was about $28,000 a, a year, oh. US. Uh, so, you know, they're saying they're placed in high-stakes environments that uh, required near-perfect accuracy in navigating Facebook's ever-changing content policies uh, while being subjected to imagery that could... <laughs> <laughs> As this article says, sometimes begin to haunt their dreams within weeks. Oh, God. I, I actually just want to find these people and give them a hug. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to take a break here on the app show. When we come back, we'll be talking with the folks over in Mappinhood. This is a, a new app that uh, is like the ways for uh, navigating pedestrians around cities. Back after this. You are back with the app show. Mike Hagerbo here with John Beeler. Well, we all probably use some form of uh, mapping program, whether that's Apple Maps or Google Maps, and it's fantastic for cars. Uh, what about pedestrians? Yes, you can uh, use it to uh, navigate if uh, you're just kind of walking around uh, a city. Well, we want to talk about uh, a new app called Mappinhood, available in Toronto and coming to other cities soon, that uh, focuses not so much on the cars, but more on the people, the pedestrians. On the line right now, we've uh, got one of the co-founders and the COO. His name is Arjun Mali. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I found this kind of interesting. Uh, I, you know, when I'm in other cities, uh, I use typically Google Maps or, or Apple Maps uh, to get around. What would make yours different? Why would I want to use Map and Hood instead? Sure. So you can... Map and Hood is basically the ways for walkers. It's a free social navigation app for pedestrians. And we provide safer, more convenient, and more accessible routes. Um, so for example, if you were looking for the safest route home at night, we can provide you that based on lighting, crime, and accident data. And then there's a lot of people that have um, you know, uh, like accessibility needs. And uh, for, so for someone who uses a wheelchair, for example, um, gradient data and accessibility relevant data is very important. Um, and that's also uh, available on the app. So we're able to give someone the most accessible route based on gradient data, how narrow sidewalks are, whether they're impassable or not, and any other kind of barriers that may uh, come up uh, along a route. So you likened yourself to the ways of uh, pedestrian uh, mapping. And you know, for the listeners out there that uh, haven't used Waze, it's uh, basically uh, a GPS program, a uh, navigation program that uh, gets a lot of user-generated content. You know, when there's a uh, an accident on the side of the road, uh, or there's congestion, you know, users can actually go right into the app itself and record that. Uh, I guess that's a similar thing here in Mappinhood. Yeah, for sure. So if I kind of boil down the main sort of highlights, uh, it makes it really easy for you to personalize your route. So whether you're looking for the fastest, the most scenic, um, the most accessible, the safest, based on, you know, what's happening, what's the data that's available for that, for the walkable space. Um, and then it also makes it really easy for you to find things in the city you're looking for, whether those are city amenities, things like water fountains, benches, um, even things that are, you know, pleasant to look at, like street murals. Um, and then recently we've kind of been um, adapting with, you know, the new reality that we all live in where physical distancing is becoming a really uh, a big thing. Um, so we've just recently released a avoid crowded streets setting in the routing. So people are able to 
physically distance using historic pedestrian foot flow data at intersections. And then we can layer uh, more on top of that to kind of find out what sidewalks are the widest so that are basically the best for um, you know, physically distancing, distancing yourself. And then there's also been a great initiative put forward by the city of Vancouver and then ho- and recently now by the city of Toronto too, where they're going to be opening up spaces for pedestrians to walk around uh, more freely. So we'll be highlighting those areas as well onto the app. Arjun, I, I imagine it's a big undertaking to get all that information into the app itself. And, and mm-hmm. obviously the users are going to be a big part of that, but when you talked about how narrow the sidewalks are and, and gradients and things like that, is that all user generated or are you guys yeah. inputting some of that data as well? No, that's a good question. So thankfully we live in an era where there's a lot of open source data that's out there. Um, and recently a lot of these data sets have been updated. So they haven't been updated in about six to eight years. And, and now in the last 12, 12 to 24 months, you can actually find quite a lot of good open data sets. Um, So how we start for a location, for example, is that we would start with a foundational layer and that foundational layer will be all sort of open street uh, data that's out there. So open street maps is what we use for our uh, baseline sort of map. And on top of that, we put other open source data from the city, uh, from the Toronto Police uh, database. And that serves as this foundational layer that then users can crowdsource data on top of. Um, So we put together what's like most up to date and relevant and then um, users can kind of go in there and either verify, adjust, or or input new data. Are those layers uh, optional? Like you can turn on the crime layer, for example? Yeah, exactly. So our settings is, um, is quite comprehensive. Like if you go into the settings, you can turn on all type. You can turn on either all the tags, which are about 80, over 80 different categories. Um, or, and you can basically cherry pick which data sets are important to you and what you want displayed on, on your map. And then what's really novel and, and, and what we've done is built a new routing engine. Um, so that's really where the core technology lies. So if you think about the routing engines that power our navigation apps of today, they haven't really been updated for, for many years. So, you know, GPS navigation was this sort of military technology that then trickled through uh, the civilian use case in the form of vehicular navigation. Um, and it was all about optimizing the speed of the route calculations from uh, over long distances. So getting cars from point A to point B as quick as possible and generating that route as fast as possible. So if you turn, it reroutes you and gets you straight there. For pedestrians, the sort of the needs are sort of different and all the routing, var- all, all the, the variables that considered in route and the routing engines for, for car based navigation are, are, are not pedestrian relevant. So things like turn, turn restrictions, one way streets. Um, there's a lot of other things that impact pedestrian travel. And building this catalog of, um, you know, data sets that are on walkable spaces, uh, we can basically fill in this data gap and every physical item that's on the sidewalk interacts with you in a different level. So if, um, you know, if you're living with vision loss, for example, you would want to know that there's temporary construction on the sidewalk and people are able to now tell you that it's there. Um, so, you know, the pedestrian navigation is basically an add-on feature and it's never really been built. Uh, a routing engine has never really been built for pedestrians and people aren't cars. So why should we navigate like them? And that's kind of the, the whole premise for how we kind of started this investigation and started rolling out the, uh, the features in the app. It, it sounds like a really great feature for a really walkable cities. How easy is it for that pedestrian to sit there and, and update what they're encountering on those sidewalks or on the streets? Uh, yeah, so it's it's pretty easy. It's, the main mechanism is through our tagging button. So you would essentially press the tagging button. It would open up a menu of all these different types of tags. And uh, so, for example, if you've come across a water fountain that is not displayed on the map, you can you can tag it there, and you can adjust the the influence of the tag. So, say if it's a park, you can actually have the radius go out so it covers the entire park. Or if it's a bench, it would you could have the radius right down to one to two meters. And um, the way it works is we, we need others to verify the tags before they go live onto the platform. So right now it's set at uh, two other people need to verify that that tag exists. And we've sort of incentivized people to input data through sort of gamification. Like we made it a little bit fun. Like there's kind of quests that you can do on a daily basis. If you're out for a 30 minute walk, um, you know, um, tagging, tagging certain data sets could be very useful for people that uh, have, um, 
accessibility needs, for example, whether those be stairs or, um, you know, narrow sidewalks or, or, or um, any, any obstacles like that. So kind of like Pokemon Go, but actually useful. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to, it's kind of a cross between ways in Pokemon Go. If, uh, yeah. That's a good way to put it. We're talking with uh, Arjun Mali. He is uh, the co-founder and COO over at uh, Immersive. Uh, they've created a new app called Map and Hood, available in Toronto right now. Arjun, when are we going to see this in Vancouver or other cities? Hopefully really soon, Mike. So I think part of our roadmap for the next uh, two to three months is really scaling um, or making the platform available across Canada. Um, and Vancouver, Montreal, Calgary, Edmonton, these are like the next, the next uh, steps for us. Um, so we're sort of ingesting all the data right now. And um, it's, it's once we're at a point, it's kind of just flicking a switch and we'll have, have it available. Right now, the app is available to download for all Canadians. But if you did download it right now, the, the routing wouldn't work. So you'd be able to actually download it and have a look at all the pages, see what, what are in the settings and see, basically have an overview of the app. But if you tried to pin in destination and go there, uh, we wouldn't be able to provide you the route right now. Um, that's limited to Ontario. And uh, we hope to expand that really soon. Arjun, where can people download this app? So it's available on iOS and Android. So if you go to our website, www.mapandhood.com, um, you can find out more information and the, and the download links are right there. But otherwise, um, yeah, if you're on iPhone, go straight into the App Store and type in Map and Hood. You should find us. Um, same thing with the, the Play Store for, for Android. That was Arjun Mali. He is uh, one of the co-founders of Map and Hood, uh, an app made for pedestrians. We're going to have to take a break. You've been listening to the App Show here on the Chorus Radio Network. Back after this. You are back with Mike Agarbo and John Beeler. We've got uh, an interesting guest coming on the line here. Uh, we're going to be talking about Apple's Swift Student Challenge. This is a cool uh, coding challenge uh, for students out there. Uh, the winner will be announced at uh, the big Worldwide Developers Conference uh, that takes place uh, June 22nd. This year, because of the pandemic, like many other events, uh, it will be held virtually, but uh, we know that thousands of people will be attending this on the line, uh, we have uh, our guest today. He is a 14-year-old Vancouver student. His name is Pranav Karthik, and he is uh, a great example of someone who's discovered the impact of uh, his uh, coding skills and uh, was uh, an attendee at uh, the Worldwide Developer Conference uh, last year and also received a tweet from uh, Apple CEO Tim Cook uh, acknowledging his uh, tutorial online that helped teach other Swift uh, other students Swift uh, coding language. Thanks for joining us, Pranav. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Great. Uh, tell us, uh, us and, and the listeners, what uh, Swift is all about. So, well, uh, Swift is basically a programming language made by Apple to help users develop applications for iPhones, iPads, MacBooks, and all of the Apple devices. So you're 14 years old. How, how long have you been using this? So I've been using it for the past couple of years, around three probably, and I've been making apps with it for iPhones and iPads so far. So you're actually making your own iPhone apps. Right. And how, how long did it take you to actually learn this? And obviously, you're probably still learning this, uh, but uh, is, is this a difficult thing to pick up? Well, not really. Once you get like the gist of it, I mean, every programming language is basically structured pretty similarly. And because I already had some prior programming language, it was pretty easy to pick up. But I was mostly self-taught using online tutorials. Tell us about uh, an app that you created uh, called Tracker. What does this to do? So Tracker is basically a smart homework tracker, homework assignments tracker, which can help students effectively manage their assignments using powerful features such as Siri and uh, the Today widget, as well as a beautiful UI. And uh, how long has this been available? I just launched last year in October. Oh, very, very cool. Uh, is this a free app or a paid app? It's completely free right now. Very cool. Uh, you're also uh, uh, helping uh, uh, another company. I believe it's, is it called Manavada, uh, a nonprofit-based uh, company in India, develop uh, an app. Right. So they're a nonprofit helping people with the humanitarian needs and food relief and that sort of thing. 
So right now their focus is on COVID and um, relief for people worldwide, especially in the United Kingdom and uh, India. So I'm helping them build an app to help people get that information faster and get more knowledge faster, basically. How long does it take to make, make these apps? Well, it really depends, but most likely it would take at least a couple weeks to build like a basic app. But the more features you add, it'd probably take a lot longer. Very, uh, very cool. Um, from what I understand, uh, you um, actually got a, a tweet from uh, Tim Cook last year. How did that feel? So basically, uh, I was actually talking with an Apple representative the day before that, and they were taking some photos of me, but I never realized I would go that far. And when I saw the tweet the next day, I was so excited and pretty shocked. I immediately uh, told all my family members, friends, and they were all equally surprised. And it was one of the best feelings I've ever had at WWDC. <laughs> that's, uh, that's cool. Uh, so you'll uh, obviously be uh, attending uh, virtually this year? Yep, definitely. Cool, cool. Uh, what other kind of uh, coding languages do, uh, do you do? Uh, it's primarily Swift, but I know a bit of Python and a bit of C Sharp. What would you tell students out there uh, and kids out there uh, about coding that might be a little apprehensive, a little scared to get into it because it looks kind of daunting? Well, at the base of coding, it's actually really simple. And uh, I bet anyone could get into it if they actually tried because it's all pretty like user-friendly to just follow along with the steps like any tutorial. You could just follow along and do the code on your own and it would still work. So there's no reason to really get scared about it. Did so you, you start, oh, I'm sorry, John. I was going to say, uh, did you start with Swift Playgrounds on an iPad or did you use a computer and code conventionally when you started? Uh, I started on a computer, but Swift Playgrounds is pretty great. Yeah, this is a really interesting app that you can download for your iPad to do all of, you know, uh, well, they call it a playground because it let, lets you explore coding on an iPad interface, which is a really interesting way of, of doing that as opposed to coding in a programming language like you would typically have, you know, with a um, uh, like a mouse and a keyboard type of th situation versus a, a touch interface. So, so Pranav, uh, you're 14. You've already made, uh, you know, a few apps. So uh, what, what's the future hold for you? What do you what do you want to do when uh, you get older? Well, I definitely want to get a job at Apple because, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Apple's pretty great, but I, I want to work as um, a developer for different parts of Apple's products probably, and that's my goals for the future for right now. Well, it sounds like you're already best friends with Tim Cook, so <laughs> <laughs> hopefully if you keep it up, there might be an opportunity there. Yeah, for sure. Very, very cool. Hopefully. Well, Pranav, uh, I want to thank you for joining us uh, today and uh, good luck with everything. Thank you so much. You are back with the App Show. Mike, John, and Graham here. want to talk uh, this segment about some of the, uh, the old tech that we uh, are still uh, hoarding. I think uh, a few of us here are tech hoarders. Uh, I count myself in. I actually uh, had a bit of spare time during the, uh, the self-isolation here, and I've been cleaning my garage and I have found <laughs> all sorts of old crap, old tech that uh, continues to sit there. And do you think I got rid of it? No. I just put it back in, in a container and it'll stay there for another uh, 10 years. One of the, the, the interesting things I came across were my old zip drives. Do you remember these things? Oh, wow. The iOmega zip drive. Yeah. This I love was, those. Those, yeah. Were, those were fascinating. Back in the 90s. Uh, we were really limited on our computers uh, for removable storage. We had floppy disks, you know, the little, you know, three and a half inch hard, hard disks. The problem was that they only held 1.4 megabytes of information, like rendering them almost useless, you know, because files were starting to get bigger. That's not even a photo on your latest iPhone. No, no. And uh, so iOmega, they came out with something called a zip drive. And so these disks were hard plastic disks and they held an astonishing 100 megabytes. So compare that to a floppy disk that had one, 1. 1.4, like basically about one and a half megabytes of storage. This thing was a game changer, but they were expensive. Uh, and, you know, the disks were kind of pricey as well, but 
everyone started getting them because what other choice did you have? And, you know, you, you would look at iOmega and think, God, these guys are in a rocket ship to the moon. They're going to be one of the biggest tech companies because they have cornered the market on this removable storage. It's, you know, becoming a standard. And then guess what happened, guys? CD-ROMs. <laughs> I, I, but I remember buying a three-pack of zip disks, probably yeah. from Doppler, actually. Yes. Right, right. And, uh, yeah, and uh, it's like you, you, you had the golden ticket in from Willy Wonka. Cause like, look at all this space I have now. I know you'd run home and like, Oh, I can get rid of all this stuff and, and put it somewhere else safely. And uh, yeah, that lasted for a short while. And like any other tech, you know, when the CD-ROM did come out, you you had sort of the back and forth. You had the zip disk kids and you had the CD kids and the zip disk, you know, like they're infinitely rewritable. We can use these as many times as we want. Well, we have a CD rewritable, which to write an hour's sort of a disk's worth of uh, information when these things first came out was what, like 35 minutes to fill the damn thing? Yes. Yeah. Right? On a 2X CD ROM? Yeah. It was like the sharks and the jets, you know, they'd be rumbling in the parking lot. But uh, well, th- don't forget the, the DAT, mach- DAT machine people, too. Yeah. Right? All the, the digital music people that had DAT tapes. Oh, yeah. But so it was interesting. So people still, you know, they had these zip drives and then CD-ROM suddenly, you know, CD writers came out Mm -hmm. and you could purchase these. I remember buying my first one. I think it was like an HP CD writer and read it. (laughs) It was an external one. It was like, oh my God, it was like $800. But it was magical because instead of like 100 megabytes of storage on a disc that these zip drives had, I could store 650 megabytes like literally six times as much as a zip disk. Truly a golden age. Well, and literally within a, the space of a couple of years, it just, it annihilated the zip drive. Like it yeah. just... I, I Omega came out with the jazz drive, right? Yeah, Which one was gigabyte. The, the one gigabyte after that. But I, yeah. I think that really was it. You know, the idea of these sort of like clunky cartridge style things. Did you want to be carrying that around? Not really, you know, and it just didn't really, it didn't make a whole lot of sense. And by the time that we started to get into, you know, more optical storage DVDs and, and Blu-rays, I mean, do you guys have optical media around the house anymore? No, I have lots. Of, I actually have, in my garage, I have a couple of cases of unused blanks. <laughs> I, I think I have a few leftover blank CDs, uh, but it, it would be difficult uh, to actually write or read one of them. I think my kitchen computer that I'm using right now uh, to record this show has a CD drive. I don't know if it works I- anymore. Uh, I still have my, my Apple external uh, DVD Super writer. Drive. Yeah, yeah the, the Super Drive was great. It was, what, 100 bucks, and you just plugged in through USB? I've, I've used that for, it's got to be going on a decade. Yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. Well, it's yeah. good to know if I ever need to read a CD. Yes, <laughs> Ken Colin John. Do you know what else I came across, guys? And this was amazing. I think it was back from 2001. Do you remember Creative Labs? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this was a company that was riding the wave. So after, you know, CD-ROMs annihilated iOmega, um, Creative Labs, uh, they were big into making sound cards, like the Sound Blaster. And so computers back then, they had really crappy sound. And so if you got one of these Sound Blaster cards, suddenly all your games and everything came to life. It was freaking amazing. And so they came out with um, you know CD-ROM kits. They became this giant multimedia powerhouse company. And so one of the things they came out with at the time was uh, something called the Zen Player. And so they had a few different versions. They had you know, a one for MP3s, which were becoming a thing at the time, uh, you know, music files. And they also had the, the Zen Windows Media Center portable video player. And so this, it was about the size, you know, about half the size of a brick. It looked like a big black <laughs> brick with a, a little screen on it. But you could hook it up to your computer. And if you had any video files, audio pictures, you could dump them on this thing and, and watch your videos anywhere. And it was actually amazing because I used to do a lot of traveling. Well, I guess I still do, but I used to do a lot of traveling back then. And so I could dump all my favorite TV shows and movies on this and watch them on the plane. People on the plane were like, wow, you were from the future. The future is now. The future is now. And, you know, I forget how much this thing was, probably like six, five, six hundred dollars $600, but it was amazing. But again, Creative Labs, another huge tech company. And where are they now? Well, they they were the ones who were basically leading the MP3 market when Apple dropped the iPod, yeah. right? Like famously, on, that, that, 
that changed everything overnight. Yeah, on, on Slashdot, there is a, a famous review of the iPod, no wireless, less space than a Nomad, lame. There was the creative Nomad at the time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like, I think every step along the way when Apple has released a new product, there's been some sort of quiet derision and then you come back years later and it's now Apple's market. And yeah, it's the standard. But anyway, it's just, it just shows you in the tech industry, you know, we're looking at some of the big companies right now that we deal with, like, you know, Apple and Google and, and Twitter, but things change in the tech, in the tech world, things change like 10 years from now, are they still going to be the big companies? Is there going to be some other company that we haven't even heard of yet that, uh, you know, within the space of a few years will take Zoom. over market? Zoom? Like, yeah, who <laughs> knew about Zoom a year ago? Yeah. And now they're like the, uh, the pandemic social media network. <laughs> no, seriously. Like, yeah. you know, hundreds of millions of people are using them. And they've like wiped out so many of their competitors and everyone is scrambling to keep up with them. Like from Facebook to, to Google. It's crazy. John, you had a piece of old tech that I just thought was amazing. Yeah, uh, this wasn't originally mine and my green screen on the, on the video podcast isn't going to show up, but I'll, we'll, we'll get some video of it up on, the, on it later. Uh, it's the one laptop per child, the OLPC. The idea behind this is that you would buy this device. It's a little small portable laptop and uh, you buy it, you're basically buying two. You buy one for yourself and then one for a child in a developing country. It was the, it was the idea behind it. And my friend actually bought a couple for his kids at the time, which were very young and they, they got them and they used them and then they moved on and then he gave them to me. And I actually fired it up a little while ago and it still worked. And you can actually, there's actually a Linux you can install on it. Um, it's got Wi-Fi. It's got, th this particular one doesn't have the hand crank, which is, was also popular at the time. Uh, there was a model, uh, I think, specifically for third world countries, not North America. And I think it was about, supposed to be about $100, but I think the reality turned out to be a little bit more expensive than that per device. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty neat little machine, and I'm still happy that it still works. Yeah. I mean, that was cool at the time. Uh, you know, I, I admire their uh, mission to try to get it to a hundred bucks. Um, but um, yeah, it, I thought that would change the world. I, I don't know if it necessarily changed the world, but I think they uh, started something, you know, this, this movement to get uh, cheaper computers uh, into the hands of kids. Definitely. Well, it's interesting because around that time, things were just starting to pick up in the, in the, well, they weren't smartphones at the time, but in the in the the mobile space, and I think really what changed the world was having low cost smartphones available for those developing countries, probably more so than a laptop, even. Yeah, because they're cheap, uh, and they have the same computing power, if not more, than even that laptop <laughs> did. Yes, definitely, definitely more than that particular laptop did. Okay, we're going to have to take a break. When we come back, we'll be talking about some of the things that uh, we're watching, and we've got a special guest with us. Back after this. You are back with the App Show. We've uh, got uh, a surprise yet old guest uh, with us. If you remember uh, back last year and the years before, we used to have Christina on as a regular host. Uh, she is back, forced back from her year-long sabbatical where she was uh, traveling to exotic uh, locales before the pandemic crushed all her dreams. She is back <laughs> in Vancouver to uh, help us out with this segment of what you're watching or what we're streaming. Thanks for joining us, Christina. Uh, thanks for having me, me and my uh, dreamless existence now, Mike. Well, thank God we have <laughs> Netflix uh, and the other streaming services. So, uh, you know, the rest of us guys, we've been over the past few weeks talking about some of the things we're uh, looking at. What, uh, what's catching your eye right now online? Uh, right now, I actually am a huge fan of this uh, Netflix and Vox partnership series called Explained. This has been around for a couple of years actually on Netflix. The great thing about it is that it's actually now available to pretty much everyone, even if you don't have a Netflix account. So Explained is a little bit of a documentary series. Um, each segment is about 15 to 20 minutes episode, I should say. And they cover topics that are very, um, very relevant to all our lives. Things like the gender pay gap, for example, or how pandemics work and the, the stock market. And they cover these in 15 to 20 minute episodes, which are perfect for if you are doing something else like cooking. I always fire it up when I'm cooking a meal and then it's uh, just playing in the background. Very cool. And so these are actual TV shows. 
Yeah, they're they're great little documentaries. They give you a wealth of information in such a short time. They're narrated by a lot of uh, celebrities, like Emma Stone has narrated some of these. And they've actually spun out the series. So it started as just explained, and now we have The Mind Explained and Sex Explained. And most recently, just a couple of days ago, they launched Coronavirus Explained. So there's one episode on there for that all already and I'm anticipating seeing more episodes come up as the weeks carry on. And as I said, this is available to everyone now. Uh, Netflix used to offer this content for free to educators through their YouTube channel, but now that since educators are at home, they've made it available to everybody. Thanks, Christina. That was uh, explained on Netflix. Check it out. That's all the time we have left for the app show. Visit our website, getconnectedmedia.com to enter uh, all the contests we have and check out the video podcast as well. See you again next time.